Good morning, everyone. My name is Carly Schledwitz, and you have logged in today uh, for a webinar from TenCare for all of the patient-centered medical home organizations and Tennessee HealthLink organizations. We're going to be uh, g delivering a presentation about the risk adjuster that is being used in these programs, uh, which is called CDPS. So we're really grateful to have uh, Dave Knutson here on the line. Um, he held a position as the director for the Center of Delivery Organizations and Markets at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in D.C. up until um, January 2017. He's done a lot of research and publications focused on risk adjustment, provider payment, and performance-based purchasing, insurance markets, and delivery system innovation evaluations. So really a lot of really very relevant experience. He was also um, part of the original group that developed CDPS, so we're lucky to have him here to answer questions and deliver some of his expertise. So I am recording this session and we'll make sure to post it on our website uh, within about a week or so um, once we have the recording up so that you can share it with any of your colleagues that were not able to join us this morning. Uh, Dave is going to deliver the presentation and then we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. If you have any questions as we go, feel free to type them in the chat box. Please make sure to type them addressed to everyone so that we can all see the questions. And then uh, at the end, we will answer those questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Dave, and we'll get started. Well, thank you, Carly, and good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be able to provide you with a brief overview of the basics of the combined chronic illness and pharmacy payment system that is being used for various programs in the state of Tennessee. Uh, I'll use the term CDPS from here on as a shorthand. Um, I will be covering numerous topics at a fairly high level, but but hopefully during the Q&A session, I can address any lingering questions you have. Um, for very specific questions about the history of implementation of CDPS in Tennessee, I'll rely on Carly and my Tennessee state colleagues for, for responses. Today, we're going to cover a number of topics. Uh, first, what is CDPS? Um, and briefly, how is CDPS used uh, for your programs in Tennessee? Um, getting into some design basics, the first step in the development of a grouper like CDPS is the grouping of the diagnoses into logical categories, and these are the so-called building blocks of CDPS. Um, after that, we'll talk about um, what the building blocks are, are ready, then we need to compute risk weights to determine um, the cost of various cat, um, diagnoses and, and how well they predict overall total cost of care. I'll cover a couple of very different types of predictive models that are used um, frequently um, for CDPS and other risk adjusters. I'll give you an example of risk weights for a few selected diagnosis categories, talk about computing individual risk scores, shine a spotlight very briefly on risk adjustment for behavioral health, um, give you a few examples of computing individual risk scores, and then talk about limitations of risk adjustment. CDPS is a state-of-the-art claims-based risk adjuster, but uh, as one would expect, and as physicians and nurses, you, you tend to identify flaws in these things. Um, there are limitations. Um, then I'll provide a few selected sources for those of you who want to dig in um, a little more deeply. All right, what is CDPS? Um, it is a claims-based diagnosis right classification right system <laughs> that was developed about 20-some years ago um, by Drs. Richard Kronick and Todd Gilmer at the University of California, San Diego. It was developed expressly for these new, the, this new thing called managed care in Medicaid and designed to make health-based or risk-adjusted payments for Medicaid beneficiaries. Separate models existed then and today for TANF populations versus disabled, adults versus children, and others we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, current uses of CDPS include premium and capitation rate setting, also performance assessment for value-based purchasing, 
and risk stratification for care coordination, and we'll see examples of that in Tennessee. It is used by far more state Medicaid programs than any other available tool. As a matter of fact, it's used by far more state programs than all the other tools combined. Uh, CDPS plus RX model com combines medical diagnoses and a handful of selected prescription drugs that are used as proxies for diagnoses and cover for situations where uh, a condition is clearly present, but the diagnosis is missing. Um, software information is available at the University of California San Diego website. I give you the URL right there. Well, how is CDPS used in Tennessee? Um, for your primary care medical home program, the PMPM payments for the medical home program are risk adjusted using CDPS. And additionally, outcome payments for high volume medical homes, which are based on total cost of care performance, are also risk adjusted using CDPS. And also risk scores that are visible in your CCT or care coordination tool are derived from CDPS. So you can see all of these uses I described earlier are in play here. For HealthLink, your risk scores visible in CCT are derived from CDPS. Now this presentation will provide an overview of the basic design features and methods used to risk adjust risk these adjust payments these using CDPS. All right, let's begin. Um, the first step in developing a risk adjustment tool is figuring out how to group diagnoses, and that was true of CDPS as well. Diagnoses, and in this done. case, um, selected four, prescriptions two, are combined. Three, seven, four, one, one, into four, about five, eight, is not available. <laughs> 877 stage one diagnosis categories. Now that number 877 is not a magic number, but it's, um, it, it's, it shows you the level of granularity with the first uh, level of mapping of ICD codes. Uh, and they correspond to major body systems and type of diagnoses. For example, an example might be diagnoses that are called hypertension or diagnoses called coronary artery disease or congestive heart failure. Now these stage one diagnoses and categories are further aggregated in this case into about 140 what are called major CDPS or major diagnosis categories. Um, often less are used based on the, the, the data and the population, but that is the next uh, sort of cut, if you will, of aggregation. Um, major diagnosis categories are hierarchical in CDPS and risk credit is assigned only for the most costly category in a hierarchy. Um, here I provide an example of the cardiovascular major diagnosis category, and you can see its hierarchy going from very high, medium, low to extra low. Um, if a beneficiary has codes that map to cardiovascular low, and in the same period, usually a year, maps to cardiovascular very high, the individual will receive risk credit for only the highest cost category. And this is to avoid uh, duplication um, related to, well, related comorbidities. The development of the CDPS diagnosis grouping logic was an iterative process of lumping and splitting and trying different approaches to lumping and splitting of diagnoses into categories. Throughout the whole process, panels of physicians and coding experts were, were at the center of it and provided input in determining initially the optimal lumping and splitting categories. They were then tested statistically as uh, using claims data and then with that feedback, the clinicians further refined the, the categories. And that iteration is what led to the final, final building blocks, if you will. Now, the medical costs that are predicted by the general CDPS model includes the following services. And I won't go through the list, but what you can see is that they're kind of a standard benefit package for a comprehensive Medicaid program. Now, it's important to note that even though the costs from all these services are included, um, diagnoses from certain of these settings are not because um, they are not verified um, ambulances, certain freestanding imaging centers, others where they're likely to be tentative. Um, the, generally speaking, diagnoses from offices, hospitals, nursing homes, and a few other settings that are where clinicians are, are present um, is, are included and other diagnoses considered to be uh, less reliable or not.
So the end goal was to produce a parsimonious set of diagnosis groupings and that met a number of criteria. There were often trade-offs required to optimize across these criteria. For example, they needed to be internally homogeneous uh, in terms of both cost, but also clinical meaningfulness. If there was a code, uh, if there was a diagnosis that was quite similar to another, it was usually con included in the same category, even if the cost implication was different enough so it might have been included in another category. Um, they also need to be sufficiently independent um, among each other in terms of cost and now in terms of predictive performance. In other words, each of these categories needs to offer an independent predictive contribution to total cost of care. They also needed to be robust in terms of coding practices and concerns for inducing perverse coding incentives. Now, ill-defined diagnoses that rely primarily on clinical judgment and with significant practice variation were often not included in the final TDPS models. For the RX prescription input into the model, where there was substantial disagreement among physicians about indications for use or concern with overuse, those drugs are not included. An example would be Ritalin. Typically, a single occurrence of a diagnosis code, either a diagnosis or in this case um, with a combined model of prescription proxy, that maps to the same category will trigger all the risk credit that will be given during that year. Additional occurrences of, a, of the same code or other codes that map to the same category will not receive additional credit. For example, hypertension unspecified and hypertension mapped to the same major diagnosis category. If a member has both diagnoses over the course of the year, it'll only be factored into the risk score once. It's like a binary variable that's off or on. Now, it's important to note that all costs for a population are accounted for somewhere in the model. Members without any diagnoses that map to a diagnosis category will be given at least a baseline age sex risk score. And it's also important to note this happens far more frequently in children as one would expect. Okay. Now we have the building blocks ready. Now, how do we compute the risk weights and essentially produce the predictive model? It's important to note something that you're probably all very familiar with uh, in your practice, but from an actuarial standpoint, risk is not normally distributed in almost any, any covered population, whether it's Medicare, commercial, or Medicaid. What I mean by that is the average or mean per capita cost in a population lies somewhere between the 75th and 85th percentile, far right skew. Thus, the implication is that approximately four out of any five beneficiary will have below average risk or cost. And that, that is something to think about when you're thinking about the, the risk weights that are coming out of the raw model. Often they will, they will be adjusted so that they you know, arithmetically so that they will appear differently, but it's important to recognize that anybody above one is probably in the upper quintile in terms of risk in the population. Now, CDPS provides separate models for different populations, adults versus children, disabled versus TANF, and it also has models that are calibrated for different benefit packages, namely pharmacy carve-out version, mental health carve-out version, and a mental health and pharmacy carve-out version. Now, the rel risk weights in these models are relative. They're internally consistent within each model and determined from a separate claims data set for each model, meaning a separate population, adults versus children again. And they reflect actual diagnosis and treatment patterns in these separate populations that were used in some ways to even develop the building blocks, but always in calculating its weights. Thus, identical diagnosis histories will produce different risk scores between, for example, adults or children. <clears throat> Perspective versus concurrent models. Uh, risk adjustment tools often offer two basic model types, and that's based on the time frame of the cost being predicted. The perspective model uses diagnoses from period one, often year one, to predict an individual's cost in period two, often year two. In 10, 10 CARES MCOs use the perspective model to calculate activity payment, PMPMs for medical homes. 
Altruista uses the perspective model to calculate risk scores in the care coordination tool. And you can understand, so they're taking an individual's history uh, to predict subsequent utilization and cost. The concurrent model, on the other hand, uses diagnoses from period one to predict or explain an individual's cost in that same period. TANCARE MCOs use the concurrent model to calculate risk-adjusted total cost of care for high-volume medical homes. And again, this is Medicare uses a prospective model to set rates for managed care plans and Medicare Advantage, but it uses a concurrent model to calculate shared savings for its Medicare ACOs. Here are some examples of prospective which risk weights for selected diagnosis categories. Um, a couple things to point out. This is the cardiovascular set of categories or hierarchy and the pulmonary. The first thing is to note that the strata are not the same between cardiovascular and pulmonary. This is often true. So you'll see, um, for example, an extra low for cardiovascular, there isn't one for pulmonary. And that, that's the result of the prevalence of diagnoses, treatment, costs and other things that just doesn't support granularity of that uh, in that uh, hierarchy. I also want to point out that it's something I said earlier that the risk weights will differ between adults and children for the same diagnosis category. Computing individual risk scores. An individual risk score is an additive sum of the age sex base rate and then added adding risk weights for each separate diagnosis category that is triggered by a single occurrence of any diagnosis that maps to that category in a year as i said earlier also as i said earlier weight is only counted or applied for the most costly diagnosis category in the hierarchy now in some cases where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts additional weight may be added for interactions of two diagnosis categories where these synergies have been identified. That's often true for the children model. Uh, one thing I should say, and I'm not going to get into the actuarial part, there's another piece that's added. Usually it's called the, it's called the intercept, and that is a normalization um, feature. So if you see intercept added there, I didn't cover it because I don't think, I think it's, it's more of an actuarial um, part of the process. So uh, the minimum individual risk score in a prospective model is the age sex base rate for an individual with no diagnoses that is no diagnosis that is counted in the CDPS model. And there are a number that aren't. Matter of fact, there's a fairly large proportion, relatively speaking, of those who have no mappable diagnosis. And there are reasons for that. And the overall predictive performance of CDPS is easily um, as good or better than other models that may be mapped more diagnoses. The minimum risk score in a concurrent model is in this case also age sex base rate, but it can mean something different in a concurrent model depending on the program, its eligibility criteria, is it, a, is it an enrolled population or a population denominator based on contact and this, all that, but in this case, it's uh, the age sex base rate. The maximum individual risk score in both models is practically limited by the range of actual cases in clinical practice and the number and type of diagnosis categories assigned rather than any mathematical limit imposed by the model. Some models, some other models have mathematical limits imposed. Risk adjustment and behavioral health. Um, first of all, let me say there is no difference in how behavioral health diagnoses are handled compared with non-behavioral diagnoses. Um, I'll give you a few examples. This is obviously hundreds and hundreds of diagnoses that map into these different levels of aggregation. Schizophrenic disorders would map to high, bipolar, affective disorder, manic to medium, affective psychosis, major depression, medium low, and senile and pre-senile organic psychotic conditions low. Here's the risk weights. This is the prospective risk weights that are offered by in the in the um, by the in the software. Um, and you, I'll just let you look at these. Um, the, it's important to recognize that you're probably going to observe different weights for the same category. Um, and this is okay if, it, if the weights have been computed properly. It's very common for, for users to 
to estimate their own weights using their own data. It's not necessary. Most of the research we've done shows that the, the, the weights that come from the multi, multiple state data set that was used to update CDPS is, is, works very well everywhere. And so, but, but if you see different weights, um, just recognize that there's a lot of user option in, in coming up with the end weights. Now, one other thing about behavioral, I mean, so these, all of these risk weights are based on practice patterns and diagnosis patterns that existed when the model was calibrated. Uh, the psychiatric categories were recently updated by CDPS. Uh, an additional category was added because, the, but, but it, the granularity needs to be supported by actual practice and diagnosis patterns. So this is an area that needs um, updating, and it is being updated fairly regularly because past practice in behavioral health is is not what we're intending and want for the future. Another thing I should say is that. Risk adjustment really isn't uh, essential if patients are randomly distributed across providers. Uh, it's the disproportionate share that, that makes risk adjustment necessary. And, and these models, uh, as I'll say a little later, actually do quite well at keeping a provider sort of whole or being fair to the provider who's attracted a disproportionate share of high-risk patients. So here are some case examples of computing individual risk scores. Here's an adult male, 55, with diagnoses of cardiomyopathy, hypertension, and COPD. This individual receives the age, gender, age, sex baseline, gets credit for cardiomyopathy, but the risk for hypertension is not added because it is in the same hierarchy and it is a, a lower cost strata. It is added for COPD and you can see the, the estimated risk score. Adult Female, 44, with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and asthma, gets the age sex baseline, and then the additional credit for schizophrenia and asthma. They're not in the same hierarchy, so all of them are included. So she has a risk score of 1.15, and recognize that put her well into the upper quintile of risk in, in the population. Finally, a child, male, 11, with a diagnosis of asthma, CP, and depression, age sex baseline. And note that the baseline is fairly high, as you probably noticed that before, and that's because there are more and more, more ki there's a larger proportion of children that don't have a mappable diagnosis, so those costs end up being accounted for in the age sex baseline. Asthma, CP, and a major depressive disorder, single occurrence, and this individual has this risk score. Well, um, limitations of risk adjustment, I'm sure you all have found them. <laughs> um, no risk adjuster is perfect, um, but uh, studies that I've done and my colleagues have done over the years have shown time and time again that these diagnosis-based models, even given the limitations of claims data, are far more fair to providers than that risk adjusting, far more fair. And actually, given um, a typical uh, degree of selection bias of high-risk people across providers, actually do a very good job uh, at a population level of, 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 of making sure that the provider is kept whole in terms of payment or more fairly treated in terms of performance assessment. Uh, predictive modeling of total cost of care is always constrained by the limitations of the data available, the prevalence of the condition, and the inherent, inherent variation in coding and practice patterns. And variation across providers in coding completeness and specificity still remains a limitation. The more these tools are used for accountability in, at the provider level, uh, the more um, complete coding we see and the more specific coding we see, and also some upcoding, to be, to be honest. And the model developers are constantly trying to adjust to that and make sure that what we're seeing is better coding, not, not uh, spurious coding. Other risk factors predict cost variation. The one that is receiving a lot of attention and I've been, I'd focused on in the last couple of years is social factors. They do predict, and you know as providers, that they do explain a whole lot of extra work. But including them right now in these models is very difficult, in part, in great part, due to a lack of a reliable, feasibly collected, and verifiable data source. But the field is working on it. 
So here are a few sources. Um, um, a couple are dated. Um, um, there's the top one is one a study I did with for the site of actuaries. It is dated, but uh, and the update that was done by Winkleman uh, a little later dated, but the information in it as a primer to risk adjustment and an opportunity to look how all kinds of different tools, including CDPS, compares in terms of predictive performance, it's still quite useful, I think, and um, it, is being cited, it is still being cited. Um, a good source would be Rick Kronick's and Todd Gilmer's initial paper, again, a little dated, it's available on their website, but it does a very good job of describing how CDPS was developed. And then also on their website is a, a little white paper on the revision of CDPS to develop the combined diagnosis and pharmacy-based model that is being used in Tennessee. So with that, um, I'm open to questions. Carly? Thank you so much, Dave. Um, that was really informative. I know this is a, a dense topic, but something that a lot of you have been wondering about, so I'm glad we were able to offer some of those details. Um, I did get one question just about when and where this presentation is going to be available, and um, we will make sure to post the slides on our website as well as an audio recording, audio and video recording of the full webinar. Um, that audio video recording might take about a week to get up online, but we'll let you know once it's there. So does anybody have any questions about the content, um, about the actual risk adjuster? If you do, um, the best way to ask your question is actually to type it into the chat feature of the WebEx. So we'll give everybody just a minute to, to think and type in your questions and uh, see if any come in. So I don't see any questions coming in. I think one thing that I took away from this presentation is how important it is to, you know, accurately, um, you know, put the, di the, the diagnosis codes into the claims because that's the only way that, you know, this tool uses the pharmacy data and the claims data. And so, um, when, uh, when Dave was talking about the limitations of risk adjustment, that is, certainly, that is certainly one of them. So one question just came in that says, how does CDPS affect the antidepressant quality measure? So that's a great question. The, the quality measures uh, that are part of this program are not impacted by the risk adjustment. So, uh, we are using, for the most part, HEDIS definitions for those quality measures. So um, HEDIS has a set of uh, specifications that will determine which of your members get pulled into the denominator. And then of those members, the ones that are on the antidepressant medication in the proper way would get counted towards, you know, your quality measure. And the full definition of that measure is in the HEDIS specs, which are on the Care Coordination Tool Knowledge Library. Yeah, there, and what I would add to that is that if, if the implication of the question was, okay, now we're really, um, now we're prescribing antidepressants, I assume that you're also diagnosing major depression when you do that. In other words, you're not, so the, the Rx portion of the model um, and I don't have the 15 categories in front of me here, and, but let's say that um, antidepressants does map to a depression in cases where the diagnosis doesn't exist. But um, it's probably true that the diagnosis exists now when you're actually, um, because it's probably part of the denominator for um, the quality measure. So to the extent that you're diagnosing more, to the extent that uh, and that's leading to the prescription, um, that would increase your risk score uh, in the model. Thanks for that. So another question came in, on what schedule are risk scores updated? So in the care coordination tool, Altruista runs the CDPS algorithm once per month. 
So that's how often the scores will be updated in the tool. Um, the MCOs run the risk score every year um, annually in order to determine those PCMH per member per month payments. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I did so. One of the things to recognize in a prospective model, um, generally speaking, you need a, about six months of claims history to get a to get a fairly accurate projection of what an individual's um, future uh, need will be. On a concurrent model, even one month updated each month gives you um, a, an accurate view of that individual's morbidity and its implications in terms of utilization and cost. So, so both of those make sense. Okay, great. So um, let's see, we have a few other questions that have come in. All right, one says, we have been trying to use risk scores to prioritize efforts. There have been a few patients with high risk scores that seem appropriate given the patient's age and known problems. Based on the information you provided, is it safe for us to, to assume that the patient has had diagnosis or treatments that we were not aware of? For instance, we had a patient we saw for the first time following a hospitalization. He did not report any chronic conditions but had a leg wound that wasn't healing well. Could that risk of infection been enough to give him his high score? Well, uh, yes, in the sense that, um, um, especially if we're talking about um, um, the care coordination tool, um, because again, it's updated monthly, and if the person came from a long-term care setting or a or, or wherever, um, and had the had the, um, the the wound that wasn't healing well. I mean, I don't know, diabetes, whatever. Um, that would that that's that information would be uh, wouldn't age that long. Whereas in other uses of the model, like to pay health plans, that information would would not be incorporated uh, until the next update. So, if if I'm understanding the uh, the question. Uh, yes, that would that would create this high risk score, even though you have not seen that patient, or if the patient came out of a, an institutional setting, you didn't know about the, the the wound until they showed up at your door. Right, and I'll just add to your answer there. Um, one other feature in the care coordination tool is actually you can go into the patient's record and see what other diagnosis. Is, a diagnosis that patient has, even if they weren't given by you. If that diagnosis came through um, on a different claim, you can see that in the tool. So, you know, there is sometimes a lag based on when the claim gets paid and processed, but uh, for that particular patient, though you've never seen them before, you should be able to go in and see if they do have some chronic conditions um, showing up as a diagnosis. All right, so we have another question here. Um, how are prospective scores reconciled to ICD codes submitted on claims? Um, let's see, if, if I, basically, so um, if claims, so claims would be processed and diagnosis code scooped from the claim or the encounter data from a health plan. And then that would be processed. And when you think about a prospective risk score, what's often occurring is there needed to be a sufficient observation period, usually six months of enrollment or six months of in eligibility, um, before you would actually use that diagnosis in a, to predict. And so, um, you got that lag, and then sometimes there's also a processing lag of a month or two or three. So in a prospective model, there's often a gap between um, the occurrence of the code and, the, and, its, and its impact on risk score. But, um, but in uses for like rate setting um, and, um, and even to determine future need for in related to utilization uh, risk, um, it's it's still it's a trade-off between timeliness and stability, and so that's always occurring with a prospective model. And different users will 
will balance it slightly different, but there will be a gap. A concurrent model, the gap doesn't, it, it, you know, the gap could be one month, you know, as we've, as we've heard. Okay, thanks for that. So another question came in. Um, this one says, are the risk scores communicated to us by the MCOs based on ICDs on claims from dates of service January 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2016? So um, I think what you're asking is about the patient-centered medical home risk-adjusted per member per month payment. And what the MCOs do there is they look at a full calendar year, as you suggest, um, the most recent data that they have. So in fact, for the 2017 um, rates that you've been getting payment for, you know, they may have tried to look up until um, the end of November 2016 or something like that because they wanted to give you those payment rates before uh, before you sign the contract. Um, if there's a different risk score communicated to you by the MCO, um, maybe if you could type that in the box. But the risk scores that are in the care coordination tool are updated every month based on the claims that are coming in. So right now I don't have any other questions in the box. I'll give everybody just another minute in case there are any last questions. All right, so there's another message question here that says, do newly attributed or newly assigned patients come in with just their demographic score? So that's a good question, and it really depends on the member. So if, if there's an individual who has never been on Medicaid before and is just newly eligible to Medicaid in general and there's no claims data, then that member would... Um, would probably just have their demographic score. However, if there is a member that has been in the Medicaid system for years but is just now newly attributed to your organization, the claims data history on that member would be incorporated into their score. Even if they're new to your organization, their past data would be incorporated. So it kind of depends on the situation of the individual. So another question says, um, attributed not enrolled clients are active in HealthLink. Some active clients are not showing up in the care coordination tool at all. How do we look at their risk scores? So that question is probably outside of the scope of this CDPS webinar. If you have, um, for the individual that asked that question, I encourage you to email um, the Altruista Help Desk or to call the Altruista Help Desk with the very specific information. So if you know of a member that you believe is active in your health link and you cannot find them in the tool, then we need to do some digging. Um, Altruista needs to figure out what's happening with that individual patient because that shouldn't be the case. We've done a lot of improvements recently with the data quality in the tool and we feel really comfortable now um, with that data, so please uh, contact Altruista directly with your example. And I'll just add, this is Constance, that if it's that you're seeing the member in the tool, but that they're just having attributed not enrolled status versus an active status, so you know you feel like there's an incorrect status associated with a member, that you would need to reach out directly to the MCO for that particular member to share that information with them, um, because then they would need to do some research on why that member's status may not be correctly reflected in the tool. It may actually be that their records haven't been updated or that, that you know, each MCO processes that status a bit differently. With Blue Cross, you enter that information via their portal. With United and Amerigroup, you submit the actual claim itself, and that claim is the trigger. Um, I know, you know, they've been going through a denied claims analysis, and so that was catching some of those statuses where it wasn't getting updated correctly. 
So if there's a specific concern about a, a status issue, uh, please reach out to the MCOs. They're the only ones that can update that status in the tool. Thanks, Constance. All right, so another question is, for patients that are new to Medicaid, when enough data is received, is that patient's risk score retroactively applied relative to the PCMH per member per month payment? So to answer that question, the per member per month payment is risk adjusted once per year. So at the beginning of the year, you'll be paid, you'll be notified as to what your per member per month amount is for the rest of the year. And then each year it's recalculated. So if you got a new member in the middle of the year and their risk score ended up being really high, then you would, you know, when the recalculation is done the following year, your payments would change to reflect that. But remember, it's an average of your full patient panel. So one or two high-risk members might not uh, tip the scale that much. But certainly, if you um, saw a big shift in the risk of your patient panel, then your payments the following year would reflect that. Okay, so another question says, where can we access the primary source document that describes this model? And from there, how can we learn the timelines that the MCOs use? So I'll let Dave answer the first question. Um, the website that he provided at the beginning, I think, does have the primary source document, but you, you would have to purchase a license for, for that information, but I'll let Dave elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, um, so CDPS, um, University of California, San Diego, has tried over many years to keep it essentially in the public domain, but they wanted to keep track of who was using it just for, just, just for um, be able to know what's going on. and, and so they charged a dollar, but that wasn't working. So now they have a license fee that's uh, w much less than any of the competitors, but um, but is required before you can see some of the the mapping logic. Um, they haven't been as um, they're 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 kind of public spirited, and they haven't had the big concerns with having these algorithms out there. But I can't. Um, so it, it's a matter of whether. Uh, one of the users would share what they have or or whether you could actually, um, you know, if you're really interested, find a way to get a license uh, to use it yourself somehow. Um, so I'm saying that it's not like readily available. It's kind of the secret sauce. And for the ones that are for profit, uh, it's it's kind of the proprietary part. But um, the CDF, CDPS people have not been holding it that close. So, so I would talk to the MCO, see what they're willing to share, and um, and go from there. Thanks, Dave. So I'm also going to, in the chat box right now, I'm going to put a few email addresses. Um, right there you have an email address if you have any questions about the PCMH program and how uh, risk adjustment is used there. Um, Meredith Gonson, who I'm sure you've received emails from before. And then, um, Constance can answer questions if you have them specific to HealthLink. Um, and I'll type that in the box here too. Um, but as Dave explained, the actual algorithm that's being used is proprietary and um, that was you know, part of the license that, that we purchased as a state. Um, so we can't answer questions specific to that, but we will try to help however we can. All right, are there any other questions uh, that you guys have? I think I've run through the ones that are in the chat box now. Okay, last call for questions. Great, well I really appreciate all of you dialing in. I really appreciate Dave, um, you giving your time and expertise to us. And thanks to My all pleasure. of you who asked questions because I think that's, that's helpful for everybody. All right, well thank you guys. Um, I hope you all have a great week. Bye-bye.